man in the 20th century, scientific man, philosophic man, highly educated man, wealthy man, independent man, I believe he feels like an orphan today. I read something by a Russian writer, I don't know if it's Pushkin or Gorky, and uh, Leo Tolstoy was still alive. He was a man who sought the Lord. And he said, I saw him sitting by the sea. And he said, I felt as long as Lev Tolstoy lived, I would never feel like an orphan. And have you ever noticed when the saints come around, they bring such substance and presence with them that you feel warm and comforted. I still remember when Sixto Lopez came to Pinecrest. Four years ago, it must be. He's one of the outstanding missionaries that came out of Elam. He's Carlton Spencer's brother-in-law. Their wives were both daughters of missionaries. And when Sixto walked in my front door, a cloud of glory came in with him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We need the presence of this fatherly one. Hallelujah. Blessed be his name. Tommy Hicks said when he went to South America, really not knowing what was going to happen, on the airplane he felt so lonely he began to cry. And he said he felt an arm go around him, an invisible arm. And his sorrow was turned to laughter. He laughed in the spirit. And then God gave him a simple instruction. God's Spirit began to speak the name of a man, Peron, Peron, Peron. Tommy Hicks knew he had to see whoever this man called Peron. He didn't know he was the president and the dictator of Argentina. He asked the stewardess, who's Peron? She said, oh, he's the president of Argentina. He said, I've got to see that man. Hallelujah. Let's just sing together, we'll give him all the glory. Hallelujah. We'll give him all the before him where they saw his star. Praise God. Luke chapter 18 and verse 35. And it came to pass that as he was come nigh into Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. It occurs to me this evening that not all who are blind realize they are blind. And we may read a passage or a book like Victor Hugo's Les Miserables about the, wretch, the wretches of this earth and tend to be like the Pharisee in the Bible and say, God, I thank thee that I am not like them. And how many times I have done that and my mother and people in my family, we heard about the 1,400 million people who are 
starving in the earth and we thank God that we weren't like them. But Jesus reveals to us in the book of Revelation that there can be a people who are in such a case that they ought to be begging, but they aren't begging because they're living in a religious fool's paradise. And this is said to us in Revelation chapter 3. And verse 14, he says, Unto the angel of the church of the Democrats write. <laughs> I was studying this word lately, and you can really render that Democrats, and I believe it's very close to a true translation or the sense of the word. Laodiceans means the judgment of the people. Democrat means the rule of the people. Whoever has judgment has rule. These things saith the Amen. I read in the book of Acts that when Paul was converted and was yet blind, waiting to receive his sight, he was living in a street that is called Straight. God, this righteous God, this holy God, who is the Amen and the faithful and true witness, wants to so change us and straighten out our lives that we could reply to the word of God with an honest and a holy amen. For it was told to me that one time Sister Beale was preaching in Detroit, someone called out amen, and Sister Beale shot back and said, that's an unholy amen. For it is not service of the lips God is looking for, but reality dwelling deep in the heart. It is not for someone who can make a Pentecostal display, which may be nothing more than noise or confusion, but it's someone who has reality dwelling in their heart in so much as they can say amen to God's own testimony and God will say that's just right hallelujah and he says to this church and I think there are different reasons why we could link this church to the church in the end of the age in the first place it's the last of the seven in the second place, the very term Laodicean or democratic would speak of a church that would rise after the coming of social democratic revolution, which began around 300 years ago. For it was only since a little before the French Revolution that the people have really had the power. And in our idealistic philosophers' minds, there throughout the hope that once the people had the power, oppression would be a thing of the past, evils would be eradicated from the earth and an ideal society would arise. But we find out that democratic government brings more evil than monarchies do and ruled by kings, despots, dictators, and emperors. For things are worse in the earth now than they ever were before. Not economically, we have more things. We have more blessings. But Jesus says to this kind of a people, because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not, the Lord reveals that it is possible to be wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked and not to know it. So there is a people on the earth tonight who ought to be begging who are not begging. There ought to be out of their beings going a cry to the throne of God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord who is true. I'm uneasy these days because I sense that we are allowing the truth to get veneered again and covered over with many layers of vague religious sentiments. And we are in danger of going about the same thing the Pharisees did, to build ourselves a comfortable religious house, to become parasites on humanity, and to receive the material and temporal things of men, and to give them nothing back in return, to have no life, no power, no anointing, no victory, no deliverance for them. 
In the epistle, in the epistle of Pseudo Barnabas, there is a test for a false prophet there. The test is a simple one. It says, if a man come to you and take of your food and, and stay in your house and receive offerings and give you nothing in return, he is a false prophet. That is one criterion. There are many others. That is one. But the Bible says there was a certain blind, blind man by the wayside begging. One of the horrors I have seen in life is that when you are not quite up to par culturally, you get pushed over to the side. And uh, your portion and your inheritance becomes the dust or the ditch at the side of the road. And verse 36 reveals in these words, hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. The meaning of life passes you by when you're weak and sickly and under par and ignorant and nobody wants you. The meaning of life passes you by. There is a class of people who are consciously too weak and too poor and too dispossessed for there to be any hope for them except in the merciful and compassionate heart of Jesus himself. One thing I have begun to understand and penetrate an uncomfortable reality is that our English and American deeper life movements usually forget about preaching the gospel to the poor. But Jesus said when he came in Luke chapter 4 and announced his political program and, and declared the individual planks thereof, he took the book of the prophet Isaiah and he opened it up and found the place where it was written, Luke 4 and 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And as I was reading many, many different things these last few years, I don't know who the author was now, I guess a theologian, maybe a European expert, maybe a Dutch reformed. He said, you can judge things by whether the poor are getting the gospel preached to them or not or whether a movement is forgetting about the poor and they're all wrapped up in themselves and their self-development. I believe a prerequisite for true Christian growth is that we get off the self-centered platform of, of bourgeois, comfortable Christianity. We've got to somehow get off that platform and begin to have a heart for others. We've got to break through the prison house of self. Our whole modern culture has made us so conscious of what we have to wear and what we have to eat and how we look and how we present ourselves and whether we can climb the social ladder uh, progressively and steadily. We, we care about all those things. And one of the manifestations is that when a people come together in a local assembly and things really seem to prosper, they almost always build themselves a temple costing millions if possible. They put the money in the building. Where is the people and when will the people arise who will either put the money in the message or the people and forget about the physical plant? The Bible says here we have no continuing city. You're never going to build a temple in this Christian age, in this new creation time, that God will validate with a cloud like he did Solomon's temple. Jesus spoke to the woman. He said, woman, that's all past. Stephen, standing in true uh, uh, extemporaneous prophetic radicalism in chapter 7 of Acts says, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Where is the people who will grasp the true radicalism of the New Testament and never let it go again. 
You know, there was a woman in the Old Testament called Hannah whom God had so dealt with that out of her came a deep and authentic cry that would come from the depths of man and touch the depths of God. And the Bible says her husband Elkanah tried to give her a worthy portion and pacify her and shut her mouth, but it wouldn't work. Hallelujah! Blessed is the people who cry out. And when this man Bartimaeus cries, there were plenty of people who had form and order in man who says, hold your peace, man. Be quiet. But he cried so much the more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My wife was fellowshipping Sister Heflin in Detroit. Brother and Sister Heflin had moved up from Tennessee. He worked at Unirol for 40 years. Got miners lung from the lamp black and the tires. Just about that time he was retiring. And, but just before he did and they moved back to Tennessee, Mrs. Heflin said to my wife, why don't you go to, with me to my church, a mainline Protestant denomination. And my wife went and it was very dry and very modernistic, very filled with denials of of the fundamentals of the faith. You all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Modern doubt. And so Dr. Parrish announced that he was going to preach on miracles the next Sunday. So on the way home, my wife told Mrs. Eflin what he was going to preach. My wife said he's going to discredit every miracle in the Bible. He's going to demythologize the Bible. He's going to call leprosy a nervous rash and down the line. Oh, Mrs. Evans says, not Dr. Parrish, never. <laughs> She'd been going to church there for years. My wife says, you just wait and see. They went back. She went back with her the next Sunday. And Dr. Parrish disproved every miracle in the Bible. <laughs> with even foolish, absurd reasonings. Shallow, childish sops for modern puny intellects explained away what was written in the book that stood for several thousand years of man <laughs> bless god read the bible saints and stick by it you're not apt to come up with any his wisdom that'll equal this Amen. this is a tried word the bible says he's like the preacher that preached and said, the loaves and the fishes isn't hard to explain. They were simply very large loaves and very large fishes. <laughs> I heard Velmer Gardner respond. He said, those loaves would have reached from Chicago to Pittsburgh, and the fish couldn't get around the bends in the Ohio River. <laughs> and a little boy brought them to the feast, to the, to the preaching or to the teaching service. Then he also said that, the Red Sea crossing was no great miracle or mystery. He said the, the sea's only two inches deep there. Brother Gardner said, how did Pharaoh's army drown in two inches of water? <laughs> they had to get out of their chariots, put their faces down, and inhale. <laughs> to drown in two inches of water. And so the man knocked it all down and then he said, why those people back there never had miracles? He said, you are the people of miracles. You have television. You can turn on a switch on a little box and see a man at a distance, hear him talk. And you can see events on the other side of the world. You can pick up a thing, do some uh, uh, dialing and, and talk to someone. And he said, you're the people of miracles. They weren't the people of miracles. At the end of the service, he said, go forth and do miracles. And they're doing their miracles. And look at the world we have. These cities are an insoluble problem. Every element in America, the poor, are an insoluble. Crime is an insoluble problem. Everything is an insoluble problem. It has to be the heart of Jesus that picks up our cry, who walks into our lives, who will deliver us from the position at the side of the road where the meaning of life passes us by. Hallelujah. It's a romance for me to merely think the thought of the change that comes when Jesus comes. 
On the road he wrote a song, then Jesus came. One sat along the highway begging, and then Jesus came. I am realizing in my life now as never before, I don't know if preaching has helped to bring it to pass, I realize I am an extremely needy person. And I have been brought into the low place by the workings of God's Spirit. I feel low. My mind is low, empty in fact. I feel poignantly that I am nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing. I can say nothing. I have got to simply, with all that is within me, cry out to Jesus, who was sent into the arena of human need to fulfill that need. Nothing. I've been, in, I've been through modern science and scientism. I've been in through various philosophies. They make you worse. They take you from despair to radical despair. They take you from somewhere conscious of need out to the boundary where you look over into a gulf of nothingness and impossibility. That's where modern philosophy takes you and leaves you. Modern life, the city takes our people, chews them up and spits them out in little pieces. We have drug addicts, emaciated, wasted away and dead in their 20s. Young women who are soiled and ruined and have no self-respect and are almost unsalvageable. But Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. has the answer. Amen. Just two lines of a song I was singing in a recent convention are ringing in my memory. We are marching in Messiah's band. He has the answer in his mighty hand. Hallelujah! I don't know the answer when someone counsels with me, but I know someone who does have the answer, and he never fails. Hallelujah! Blessed be his name. Hallelujah. He cried when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And something that's almost maddening about the Bible, we don't really know how much blind Bartimaeus knew. He must have heard a report. How would he have known to cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, just from hearing rumors about a healer, have mercy on me. Could it be that the Spirit of God himself came upon this man and gave him a prayer that was more than human, but was even divine? Could it be that God so loves the low, the lowly, the, the, the dispossessed, the outcast, the shirtless ones, that God himself comes upon them in their extremity of need and bestows upon them a prayer that is as inspired as God himself can make it? Hallelujah! A prayer that is utterly and absolutely fitting and appropriate to the situation. Hallelujah. Oh, something else I love about heaven. When heaven speaks, heaven doesn't say much. I have been treated to charismatic prophecies that have many, many, many words in them. But when heaven itself really speaks, there is so much power and so much reality and so much dynamic and so much life that are compacted into heaven's words that heaven doesn't get a chance to say much until the thing is delivered or changed or the miracle comes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was just digging through my papers tonight and I saw that when the angel spoke in the Gospel of Luke, I'd counted up the words, about 50 words they spoke to the women dissolved all their doubts, explained why his body wasn't there, Did it took them from the realm of human wonderment into the realm of heavenly and divine certitude, into something that could go forth, just women, some of them nameless, and preach the gospel for the first time in such a way that even the apostles couldn't or wouldn't believe it. Heaven had spoken. Heaven had spoken into their situation. A word had come, oh, to receive a word from God. Oh, to have Jesus Christ himself ask us about our problems. Uh, you fished all night, have you? Have you caught? No, we haven't. Put the net on the other side of the boat. Oh, what a word. Blessed be God. Not mystical in complexity, but mystical in simplicity. 
Nobody ever had to run for the dictionary when Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth spoke to them. He will speak a language to you you can understand. There was a brother at Pine Ridge a few years ago. He's a, literally a madman. Almost went insane in my class over there. Sat up all night listening to voices and he wrote me mystical words. Something spoke to him. One was analevic, one was ubezidol. One's in a dictionary, one isn't. That's not Jesus. <laughs> he doesn't come and chatter to me in ancient Chaldaic or Basque or Arabic or some language. That I don't know. He speaks my language, not even just English, not even American, not Midwest. He speaks my brand of language, my precise, peculiar, uh, uh, what do you call it, <laughs> vernacular. It's not a jargon. It's not exactly a dialect, a dialect, I guess. He speaks my dialect. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It would have been something if he had stood before Barnum and now be quiet, Barnum, I'm going to give you your first lesson in theology. I am co equal, co eternal, and co substantial with the Father and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> <coughs> I am the Logos that men like Philo scratch their heads over. I'm the universal revelatory power in all nature and humanity. Something I want to look at, I think it's in Mark, in the same story about blind birth. It's Mark chapter 10. Hallelujah. How many can say, praise the name of the Lord? Praise Bless God. God. I can't understand how religious leaders become God. I can't understand it. I'm glad I'm not God. Using psychic trickery to put the people under their spell. Just reading about... The woman had found the shakers, Annalise, mother they called her, called herself the elect lady. She said, claimed she'd give the Holy Ghost to anybody she pleased. And when you dealt with her, she went through all kind of crazy gyrations to impress you. Probably shaking, trembling, rolling the eyeballs. Somebody tried that on me just recently. They wanted me to know they had power over me. <laughs> I sat there. I sat there like a cigar store Indian. I didn't get to witness. <laughs> Somebody who really feels they're powerful in God, and they are in a way, but they need some disciplining. God help us not to get gifts of the Spirit and go wild with them, but God help us to say, like Jeremiah, Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. What's that have to do with blind Bartimaeus? <laughs> Well, we won't go far down that siding. The Bible says, when Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called, Mark 10 and 49, they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort. Rise, he calleth thee. Hallelujah. There is resurrecting power in the call of Jesus. You may be in the lowest place when he calls you, but his very call, his very word, will automatically raise you up. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. Salvation comes in funny ways. Down in Bradford, Pennsylvania, many years ago, there was a notorious prostitute called Maggie. Pentecostal people took her, locked her in a room, and said, you're not coming out until you get saved. And she spent a long time ranting, raving, screaming, and beating the walls and the door. But she thought it over. And she walked out of that room a saved woman. A prostitute went in the door. And out of that door came a saint, already walking on a higher plane. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be of good comfort. Rise. He calleth thee. Hallelujah. I'm glad Jesus called me. I'm living a better life. My vision is on a higher plane now. Praise his name. Hallelujah. So Jesus said, not some heavenly philosophy that no man, even Plato, could cope with. He basically said, what do you want? What do you want? When I was younger, I was more and more seeking for God in complexities 
profound religious constructions. And so at that time in my life, I was passing over all the simple words of the Bible. I wouldn't notice a word like that because I had my health, I had enough money to spend, I had a job, I had a good mentality, I had talents. I wasn't interested in Jesus saying, what do you want? I was interested in building my life. I had my ideas. I was full and running over of, of ideas. But I believe that out from eternity, there is an eternal reality breaking into your temporal situation tonight, and it's the voice of Jesus saying to each one of you, what do you want? Hallelujah. Do you hear him saying that? What are you choosing for your portion? Do you feel that? Coming not at the verbal or linguistic or cerebral level, but hear you somewhere down in your heart, the voice of Jesus, the voice of the one who can supply, saying, what do you want? Hallelujah. I marvel at Jesus and his directness, his appropriateness, his common sense. The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Do you think we could possibly bear any relationships, any relationship to the Jewish religious authorities in chapter 9 of John's Gospel? Where he healed a blind man and then believed and then worshipped. And in John 10 and 39, Jesus says, For judgment I am come into this world that they which see not might see, and that they which see, we could probably add, and they which think they see, might be made blind. That's the danger of being in a deeper life movement. You develop an attitude where you think you see. It's called a state of deception. And the most deceiving thing about deception is you're wrong when you think you're right. And it usually takes something rather shocking or painful to open our eyes to the fact that we're not seeing, we haven't been seeing. It's like some mothers and their children, they will never believe they do anything wrong. We had a neighbor lady like that. Somebody said, Mrs. Hoover, your children are smoking. She said, no. Not my boys. They'd never do that. But one day the barn burnt down. I said, well, at least Mary Hoover now knows her boys had matches, if not cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> they burnt down the barn and burnt up the tractor. She now knows they had matches or some kind of... Hallelujah. I believe when that barn burned down, her eyes were opened. Remember how John put forth the end of his staff, touched honey, when he said his eyes were opened. Her eyes may be opened by uh, either a tragedy or an ecstasy. But whatever it takes, could we say, Lord, open our eyes that we might see. Some of the Pharisees which, which were with him heard these words and said to, unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you are blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore your sin remaineth. Your blindness goes on. It's like the cry of the watchman in Isaiah chapter 21 or 22, where they cry, Watchman, what of the night? And he says, Night comes and also morning. In other words, when morning comes, it will still be dark. Or for some people, there is no morning for them because they refuse to repent. Paul came to the Corinthian church, and as I was reading the epistle to Galatians yesterday and was teaching Corinthians recently, it occurred to me that we are Corinthian in our modern time because we are radically charismatic. We have a gift craze. We're just nuts about the gifts of the Spirit. Not too interested in going beyond that or repenting in a depth. We like uh, the, the billboard show. We like the flair, the carnival, the circus, the trumpets. Boy. We like the gifts. I'm fascinated. I went all over the country to see the greatest gifts at one time when there were greater gifts than there are now. I saw them all. 
almost all, were Corinthian, were Galatian, were soon moved from that first love of Jesus Christ. And to the Corinthians, Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hallelujah. I don't think we can advance without repentance, without a visit from Jesus. We must realize that we have been far, far more feeble than we have thought. Our life is vitiated from us gradually like the frog who sails on a chip of wood and someone puts him on a back burner and turns the burner on low and he sits there until he cooks. How could all this evil come to America that we have today? All the evil of drugs and crime and divorce and murder and the danger. You can't pick up a hitchhiker. You're afraid to walk alleys. How could it? It never came suddenly. It came gradually. It was brought on gradually. And the people, their eyes went to sleep gradually until finally they weren't seeing the light anymore. Well, when you're utterly, utterly without power, without strength, and you are one of the nobodies and one of the nothings of this world. You are in line for a visitation from Jesus. Hallelujah. He says, I came to bring good news to the poor. Blessed are the poor, he said in the Beatitudes, or blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This can be interpreted, blessed are the renounced in spirit. You know, you get born again, you learn about the working of sanctification, you begin to get into scriptures, you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and you get functional a gift, and then you begin to get into ministry, and then we're ruined. For we're building, once again, the things we once destroyed. We're building a worldly religious system that stinks just as bad in God's nostrils as the raw Babylon of this world. There has got to arise a pure, utterly sincere people who will lay hold of Jesus and never turn him loose. Amen. Who will allow him to bestow upon them the sight that is divine, the sight that penetrates beneath surfaces to inner realities. To allow Jesus to so minister that they are made whole. And as it turns out with blind Bartimaeus, in chapter 10 and verse 52 of Mark, they will follow Jesus in the way. Hallelujah. God did not expend his son on the Calvary's cross just to put raw, generic dynamic in me so that I could uh, become a kind of a worldly performing prophet and call people out and tell them things and, and be a demigod and get the worship of people. He gave me the dynamic that follows Jesus and Jesus only. Hallelujah. This dynamic will take you to certain success, fame, or fortune. It will take you after Jesus in the way that he walks. I didn't plan to preach this way tonight. I haven't preached this way for a while. But Paul says, am I now trying to please God or men? God didn't save me to make me happy, but to make me holy. He didn't send me in this world to make friends, but to do his will. Amen. Where is the man and the woman and the church and the remnant who are going to sell everything to buy Calvary's product, which is the righteousness of God? Hallelujah. I want to open to Acts chapter 3 and look at another human wretch. I finally found out what I am. God gave me a definition myself. Humanity is wretched because I'm human, I'm a wretch. I'm a special kind of a wretch. I'm a grace-bearing wretch. I have received grace in my wretchedness. In the low place, tasting the dust, being a worm, fear not you, worm, Jacob, God said. Christ cried in Psalm 20, I'm a worm and no man. 
Have any of you ever felt low? I believe that's one reason why you're here. This is the low place. <laughs> this is a low elevation. It's a place where Jesus is free and welcome and able to visit those who are past all human help and hope. And when Tim Torres said, Jesus Christ is my hope, that thrilled me. Because one thing God revealed to me about hope in this past year is hope is that which penetrates the future. What are the American people doing? They're fearing the future. They think in terms of graves, gravestones, cemetery lots and bomb shelters and that sort of thing, insurance policies, retirements. That's not God's eternal now. That's an uncertain future. They say now it is known that Social Security goes flat in 1983. That may be true prophecy. I'm not concerned about that. I never trusted it in the Social Security Fund. I never saw it. They just said it was there. They might have said it tell a lot of other lies. <laughs> we need a visitation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We need to be washed in the blood. The old gospel's got to come again. Hallelujah. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes white as snow. Wash me and I shall be whiter, much whiter than snow. Those are old evangelical hymns. Chapter 3 of the book of Acts. Now Peter and John went up together. When you begin to flow in the purpose of God, you'll begin to go up. You're tired of the dark valley, the shadows, the gloom, the defeat, the lack. Begin to walk to the cadence of redemption's drumbeat. Go up to the presence. Go up to the temple. Go up to his habitation. Hallelujah. As you get involved with God's program of blessing the lost, the poor, the wretches of this earth, you, in the process and as a byproduct, you will be unspeakably blessed yourself. Yes, amen. They went up at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. What could lift the church of this present hour? Getting an evangelist with a bigger name, who gets a bigger offering, who makes bigger promises, and has a more dazzling gift, is that the solution? Who carries in his briefcase the greatest sermons the world has ever heard, is that the solution? Or how about falling to the knees and praying? That will lift you too, hallelujah. Praise God. Oh, God's spirit is serious. He's called the spirit of truth. He's the one who gives you your moment of truth. You look in the mirror one final time, you say, I hate what I see. I've got to have help from God. I've got to be made over. I've got to be regenerated. I've got to receive new life. I've got to be purged, cleansed, and transformed. I was preaching a little over a year ago and a wife of one of the leading discipleship leaders in America was sitting there. I was preaching from Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah is caught up into heaven. And in the throne room, looking at him who sits on the throne, or at least the edge of his garment, looking at the seraphims, the glory, seeing the place shaken when the praise and worship goes forth, Isaiah screamed, Oh! That's the Hebrew word he screamed. He spoke Hebrew. He screamed in Hebrew. Hallelujah. God understood it. Everything stopped. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm undone. I'm unmade. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I was preaching on that chapter. All of a sudden, this woman, this this woman who is worldly wise, an artist, a dance teacher, and aware of many things, 
and famous and up in the high levels of discipleship uh, lines of authority, she began to cry and cry and cry. So I preached on. The Spirit of God was moving. When the service was over, she came up to me and she said, she said, I am tired of being me. And that registered in my heart. I'm tired of being me. I'm tired of feeling compelled to tell little white lies to remain socially acceptable. Tired of concealing my real personality and putting on a facade when I go to church and saying I'm fine when people say, how are you? Tired of all that. Wanting to come to reality where all the masks go down where God deals with the real me and I deal with a God whom I now know as ultimate reality that when he speaks his words it's like eternal concrete coming into my soul. Frank Bartleman said when they prayed for the Pentecostal visitation at Azusa Street he said I was praying that God would put a rock in my soul. A rock that won't shake when all things are shaken. God said, I'll shake everything, not to things in earth only, but to things in heaven. But God himself doesn't shake, and they, those in whom he has built the rock of his own nature, they also will not shake. But they will become landmarks in the shifting sands of modernity, according to Isaiah chapter 30. A man shall be as a great rock in a weary land. Here comes Peter and John. They've gone into the hands of Jesus, God's heavenly surgeon. They have been changed. The, the elements of their being have all been altered and transformed and moved from place to place. They hardly know themselves. They were just ordinary Hebrew fishermen when he came and said that word, come. Hallelujah. Jesus came to my life one day. I was of a nature that I didn't really see that I had much need. I was a fairly good young Anglo-Saxon American. Never even heard of most of the sins that are cataloged today. But it is since I have known him and been with him and been looking at the church and the world, I have become aware of the tremendous need. And I have never felt smaller in my life. I may not look like a worm at 200 pounds, but in my soul, I feel like a worm. I've been made to feel small by the state of the church and the state of our culture and our nation. Something's got to happen. Jesus has got to come. Can we cry with the early church, even so, come Lord Jesus. If it's not the final end of the age you bring with you, not the final cause, not the millennium, not the eternal age, not the putting out of immortality, but come to us and give us our sight so we can function in the days that are left to us and walk in the true path of righteousness and holiness. Peter and John going up to the temple the hour of prayer, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple. Oh, what a picture of the human predicament. Oh, what a, a picture of religious bankruptcy for over 40 years every day. Or for most of that 40 year period, he had been laid at that gate and never got anything. That temple was bereft of an answer for a lame man. Their cupboards were bare. They had spent their last anointing two or three hundred years ago. Had no more any profit. Nobody knew how long. Nobody knew. They were turning from, from receiving by the Holy Ghost to reasoning like the Greek philosophers. The sons of Israel were emulating the sons of Greece and the sons of Rome. And that ancient phenomenon called the Hebrew prophet had not been seen for many, many generations. And suddenly two Jesus men come by. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It wasn't Peter and John. It was two Jesus men who came by. The meaning of their life had altered since they had heard him coming by and called the word come to them. He said, come after me and I will make you to become 
fishes of men. Oh, men fight hard. Men fight harder than pike or tarpon or garfish or Atlantic salmon. It takes might and power to catch men. It takes cleverness of a divine order to catch men. Jesus said, I can do it for you. I will make you fishes of men. After Jacob had his night of wrestling, he's, God said, I change your name to Israel, for you are a prince of God. For as a prince, you have wrestled with God and with men and have prevailed. God is also calling for those of you in this room who will become wrestlers who will lay hold of God and God's promises and never let him rest Amen. until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth, until righteousness goes forth like a lamp. Praise God. My wife was reading the biography of Rembrandt von Rehn, history's greatest painter, and when, von Rehn, when Rembrandt was dying, he said to those about him, Open the Bible up to the story of Jacob and the angel of the Lord and read it to me. And they read the story. And Rembrandt says, so God wants us to fight. He wants fighters. who will not fight against God. As Stephen said in chapter 7, as your fathers did, so do ye. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. He doesn't want us to fight against God. He wants to wrestle God until he come and bless us. I will not let thee go until thou bless me. What mystery that mere puny, mortal, muddy, mucky, adamic man made out of meat like a cow or an ape could lay hold of the visible manifestation of the angel of the Lord and hold him that he couldn't get, get loose. Oh, the heights in prayer that beckon unto us the mountain peaks in the range of the Spirit that are saying to us across the years of time by the ancient prophetic voices, there are things there you've never dreamed of. Come and partake of the fruits that are rarer than the fruits of paradise itself. Yea, the realm of the Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel the call. I sense the call. I sense the eternal resonance of the voice of God calling us to come after Him. Hallelujah. In this story of the man at the beautiful gate, you know, the Bible is full of contrasts and paradoxes. Hannah went up to the temple every year at Shiloh. Shiloh means tranquility. And she was a tormented woman. She was barren. This man is lying at the beautiful gate. It's almost as though something wants to rub the truth in. You're not living a very beautiful life, are you? The two beautiful men came along. You know, preaching the true gospel so glorifies you that the Bible says, how lovely are their feet. That's one thing the movie stars are ashamed of is their feet. Who has beautiful feet? They who preach the gospel. Hallelujah. Men have gone with the gospel and preached it, and the recipients have fallen down and kissed their feet for sheer gratitude and joy. Hallelujah. And this story proves to us that Jesus Christ can come to the limits of human need in the person of his disciples. Jesus and Peter, Jesus and John was just as mighty a Jesus as he was in his own body in the days of incarnation. And the Bible says also that his name has in it all the power of his person. They said to him, to Peter and John, how did you do this? After that classic encounter when they were going by into the temple, he looked up and asked for alms. Somebody was talking about the great Welsh preachers, the Jeffreys brothers. Somebody said the one was so ignorant. He was a coal miner. God used him to win many souls. He influenced Evan Roberts and others in Wales. And those, they were using the great revivals. And this man was so ignorant, he said, the man asked for alms and God gave him legs. <laughs> <laughs> I 
The Bible says Peter fastening his eyes on him. That look that came out through Peter's eyes was the very look of Jesus himself. When human need meets divine ability, there was a fastening. Hallelujah. There's going to be a discharge of energy. Praise God. This is a romance, isn't it? Amen. Oh, to see God heal the sick and raise them up. Peter fastening his eyes on, on him. I wonder what that man thought when a magnetic <laughs> gaze fell upon him that had something radiating in it. And Peter said, look on us. We in our shame today would say, look the other way, please, and don't embarrass us. <laughs> oh, to walk in that state of utter cleansing, utter freedom, utter confidence. You know, I see three confident men in the Bible right now. That's not all, but I'm seeing them right now. I see Elijah on Mount Carmel. After Baal's prophets had had a Pentecostal meeting all day, they had danced leaped on the altar, cut themselves with knives, and screamed and called upon Baal. Some old Lord up there, they didn't really know his name. Baal's just a, a name for Lord in general. <laughs> then Elijah strode forth and he said, let's look back to it. First Kings chapter 18. Beautiful passage. First Kings 18 and 36. This is a picture of perfect confidence. It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Elijah even waited for a proper time. Don't try to do the miracle one moment too early. Let everything be in its time. Oh, the divine time clock. I'm learning to appreciate it. David said, my times are in thy hand. Years ago, I fasted to get the times out of God's hand into my hand. You know what I'm glad of today? My times are still in his hand. Hallelujah. I have a handmade pocket watch I carry. I wouldn't let my little girl have it. She'd break it. Hallelujah. It's delicate. My times are delicate. God keeps them in his hand. Elijah the prophet came near and said, Yahweh Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. I have marveled for years at the confidence of that prayer. He didn't say, pardon me while I go on a 40-day fast. He had it already, walking in God's confidence. And then as I've read the Gospels and looked at this man called Jesus, one supreme element stands out in Jesus to me. He is the most confident human being who ever walked the earth. He's confident in the face of demons. He's confident in the face of the prince of all demons, Satan himself. He's confident in the face of waves and wind, raging elements. He's confident in the face of death. He said, I have power to lay my life down. I have power to take it again. Confident. Here's Peter. Look on us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Things are going to be different from now on. Hallelujah. You know what he is to me, Tim? <clears throat> Brother Phil? Sister Marcerie? He's my confidence. God has been dealing with me that I am going to have to face the people who hear me preach with confidence. Not self-confidence, but we've got to learn to walk in His confidence. When we walk in His confidence, dead meetings, dry meetings, flops will be a thing of the past. When we come together, our meetings will crackle with revelation and divine power. Hallelujah. The sick will be healed. Needs will be met. Men will see Jesus. Praise God. He gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
rise up and walk. This proves to us that his name has all the power of his person in it. Peter gave them a theological uh, interpretation here when he says in verse 16, his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Hallelujah. I have the confidence that Jesus will visit me again and again in my hour of need. When blind Bartimaeus was healed, said he cast his garment from him, for Jesus Christ had become his all in all. He followed him. Hallelujah. Praise God. Did you come, sister? Praise the name of our Lord.